Great. Yeah, so it's great, really great to have you all with us uh, this morning. My name is Abby Beho, and I am the founder and program director at Lake Health and Wellbeing. I hope you all can hear me and see me clearly. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about us, so Lake Health and Wellbeing is a public health NGO based in St. Kitts and Nevis. And for those of you who may not know, St. Kitts and Nevis is in the Caribbean. And so we are um, a public health NGO and we aim to improve the health and well-being of our local, regional, global and online community. And we do that in a number of ways. So we conduct research to understand the needs of, of folks that are experiencing particular health issues. We carry out public health interventions, health education events like this, and also we do advocacy work. So it really is a pleasure for me to welcome you today to this webinar on managing fibroid related pain. Now we have decided to focus on this issue because a couple of years ago, we carried out some research to understand the experience of women who are living with fibroids who are based in St. Kitts and Nevis. And fibroid related pain was a significant challenge for most of the women that took part in that research project. And so today what we want to do is focus on what causes fibroid pain, um, what you can do in terms of managing fibroid pain safely, um, and really answer any questions that you may have around fibroid related pain. So the plan for this session is that we're going to start with uh, Ms. Quirida Finch, who will share her experience with fibroid related pain and the lessons that she's learned from that experience. We'll then hand over to Dr. Abigail Falala, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist, and she's representing the British Caribbean Doctors and Dentists Association. And Dr. Falala will take us through a presentation on managing fibroid pain. And then we'll have a Q&A session where you can share um, any questions or comments that you have with our speakers. Um, and you can put your questions in the Q&A box. And if you prefer, because I know it is a sensitive issue, um, you can ask your question anonymously. You just need to tick the relevant box in the Q&A um, section. Um, many of you sent questions beforehand, so we hope that we can address those questions during this session today. So just a reminder that this in webinar is intended so solely to provide information and the information presented as part of this webinar and any material published in relation to this webinar webinar provided for general purposes only and should not be construed as medical advice. So you should seek medical advice from your own doctor before taking any action um, around the information that's provided in this webinar um, today. So now without further ado, I'm going to hand over straight to Ms. Karida Finch and she's going to share with you her experience of fibroids and fibroid related pain. So welcome Karida, thank you so much and over to you. Hi. Dr. Abby, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you reset my video? I fell off the call, the call not long ago. Yes, I will do that. I will do that right now. Okay. Okay, there you go. So you sh hopefully should be able to, yeah, there you go. Okay, so good morning again, everyone. I am Kiri Finch, and I was diagnosed some years ago as 2019. In fact, I think the month was September. I honestly can't recall the date. Honestly, I cannot recall, but I remember going to the doctor to have a scan done simply because whenever I had my periods or my menstrual cycle, I had excruciating pain. And the pain was so severe that it became life disrupting. Now, I like to exercise. I was a former track and field athlete. And so exercise is like a passion for me. It's like therapy for me as well. And each month before my menstrual cycle, I had to pause on exercising. And during that period, I just could not exercise. And it's not because I didn't want to, or I became lazy or fatigued. It was just that the pain was so intense, like on a scale of zero to 10, it was beyond 10, it was that intense. And so I really couldn't exercise. On top of that, my productivity at work was impacted significantly. Each month, I literally stayed home 
for two days because I just could not deal with the pain that I was feeling. It was really severe. And even if I attempted to get ready in the morning, I just couldn't move beyond that point. It, it was really, really painful. Additionally, like home activities were also interrupted. So the truth is it became just life interrupting for me. And I decided to go and find out what is wrong because this could not be the norm. Although, you know, you would have discussions with your friends or even family members and they would share like they have painful periods and it's normal for some. We are all genetically different. And so our experiences would be different. That was the narrative that I had prior, but because the pain was getting more and more intense, I said, you know, there had to be something beyond that that was happening to my body. And I just wanted to be sure. So I went to get the scan done and I was told that I had two small fibroid seedlings. And when I got the news, it was communicated in a way that, oh, it's just two, five, two small seedlings. You know, it's not anything that should really affect your life, but I knew my story. And I knew that I was happy to find out what was the, contrib the main contributing factor, but the doctor <laughs> shared it in a way that you know, it should not be anything to bother you, but it was really, really bothering me. And uh, since that time, so I, I was diagnosed in 2019. And uh, since that time up until recently, the pain continued to be severe. And I, I shared my story with you. I literally would lie in bed during those two days that I take from work and do nothing because I really couldn't do anything. And that has been the struggle until I said, you know, Kirita, you have to be stronger than this. So I was trying to will myself, tell myself constantly that, you know, you can't constantly lie in bed. You have to find a remedy. And well, I didn't have a doctor to speak to. So, I didn't know, you know, anyone in the medical field who could assist me. So I was researching. I'm curious. I have that curious mind. And I found out that you could use certain medications to help you. And so I began using Viralgin. But the body is interesting. I used the Viralgin for a bit and it worked. The pain was less severe but then I had to increase the dosage. So I went from the 400, I think it was to 600. And then I just couldn't get the Viralgin anymore. So what I did, I, I said, you know, this has been working. So I am not going to stop using the tablets. I'm going to keep on using them because that's my only source of relief. And being not able to get the, Viralgin, I then sought uh, further information from a pharmacist and they told me the ibuprofen works. So I, I moved from the Viralgin and I was now on the ibuprofen, but you know, there are different degrees of that medication. I was using the 800 strength and instead of a single dose, I was using double dose. So each time I felt the pain, I would just take two ibuprofen. And if you if you're doing the maths, you would see that's eight hundred times two. It was working. I was now in a position to exercise. I was now in a better position to go to work because I always packed my ibuprofen. Anytime I, I knew that my cycle was present, I always made sure I had a stock of ibuprofen until late 2021. I recognized that my feet started changing color, but one leg, the right leg. And it was getting really, really dark. 
No, I didn't go to the doctor because I recognized that I was just monitoring, but I had to do a series of tests for another reason. And by doing the test, I then discovered that there was an issue with the liver, the, the reading on, on the liver test was off, not severely, but it was off. And then I, I found out that the ibuprofen that I was taking was actually harming. So even though it was, there was an advantage in that it was helping with the fibroid pain, it was leading or contributing to another problem. And so I said, if that is going to be the situation, you know, I have to either minimize the use of the ibuprofen or totally eliminate it. And I, I went the extreme because I said, I don't want that issue to affect my liver. I'd rather, you know, enjoy the little pain or find another solution. So I found another solution. And, uh, you know, when you're feeling pain, because we, we, we don't enjoy pain, pain is not something that is enjoyable. So you always tend to look for something that bring you that source of relief. Now, I may be a little limited here because my internet failed me this morning. I'm actually using my phone, but here I have a packet. I don't know how well you can see it. It's the wellness with the Vena blissfully best, bliss, blissfully balanced herbal tea. And I recently discovered this tea. It's purely natural. And uh, I started to use it. The instructions are that you use it prior to your menstrual cycle. And as women, we tend to have our calendars and we know when our next menstrual cycle would be. And so we are on top of the game. So I uh, would use it before my menstrual cycle. I would take like a normal tea in the mornings. And it's very potent, so I don't have to drink it more than once per day. And it really worked in terms of reducing the symptoms that accompany, accompanied my period. I used to feel very imbalanced and confused sometimes. And, you know, of course, during the periods, I would have the, the pain. But this tea actually helped to minimize the pain until... I was able to function like normally, like I don't have anything going on with my body during that, that menstrual cycle. I was able to function, I would go to work, I would function normally, of course I don't overdo, but it helped me to find that balance, that ability to function despite the fact that I was having my, my menstrual cycle. Very recently though, I, I think I was on a discovery path and I found out about a product or a series of products that really helps to reduce fibroid pain and they can also have the advantage of shrinking fibroids. Now, I heard the story and I was skeptical because I said, Many times you hear about persons who have products that are helpful, and I know that our bodies are all different, our makeup is different, and so a product might work for an individual, but it may not necessarily work for me. So I hesitated, but I think God spoke to me and he told me, you know, you sometimes you just have to give things a try. If a number of persons are saying that this product work, I mean, sometimes they might have the other motives, but I did my own research and I recognized that the product actually has benefits. It not only reduces the pain, like I said, but there is the potential for it to shrink the, the fibroids. And so I recently came across this product well, one is called Laviv, and they have in Nooni juice, acai, mangosteen, goji, and pomegranate. It's purely natural. And this one is called the Cran Aloe. They're made up of all natural products. And combine the Laviv and the Cran Aloe, 
I have been using these two products, complemented sometimes by the Love Eve Green. And uh, I kid you not, they have been working like no other product that I have ever used. I don't have to overdose. What I do, I drink a cover full of the, well, mainly the, the red Lviv and the Fan Aloe, and I don't have to take anything in the night. And that has worked to minimize the pain to the extent where functioning normally is like, it's, it's very, very normal to function with my menstrual cycle or even prior to the menstrual cycle with these products. They, my, my belly, <laughs> I think one of the reasons why I realized something was off in my body is that my tummy, although it's not big, because as I told you, I was diagnosed with two seedlings. It was a little raised. And because I was an athlete, I know how flat my tummy used to be. And I, I was always active as well. And I tend to eat well. But it was a little raised than normal. But with the, the help of these products, I realized like my tummy is getting back to the usual level. It's not the 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 Elevation is not there as much as before. Now, these products are not magical products. It's, it doesn't mean that instantly you're going to be back to normal or anything like that, especially if the, the, the size of the fibroids are really huge. But in my case, they, they have worked and I'm seeing the effects and actually feeling the effects in my body. Another thing I want to highlight is that with, with fibroids, the way we eat contributes to the development of certain things in our bodies. And when I was a young teenager, I was like, okay, I can eat anything. I'm young, although I was active, but I had a craze for mutton. And I just used to eat mutton I think I just eat mutton probably three to four times per week. But I recognize that certain foods contribute to the development of certain things that are harmful to our bodies, one of which is fibroids in my case. And so I eliminated that completely from my diet. In fact, just before I, well, I went out the house this morning and I came back and when I left the car, I saw a vehicle approaching my road and the guy said, hi, good morning. I am selling mutton. And I was like, I don't know if this was, you know, it happened at the right time. So I can share a story, but mutton is something that I don't use anymore. And that's because of the harmful effect that it can have on the body. And especially as it relates to the development of fibroids. So right now where I am at, I went to the gynecologist, I think it's sometime earlier this year. And back then I was told, that's before I started using these products, I was told that I have four visible fibroids. So between 2019 and 2022, I was told that I have four visible. So you could see that there is a growth, but I am going to take these products for a period, maybe up to six months, and then I'll do a follow-up check just to confirm where I am at. But right now, as it is, I don't have the pain as before, and I'm seeing a reduction in the, the tummy area. So that is my story. I hope that it has been encouraging to persons who are suffering with fibroids. I know many times we don't have the support in the medical circle. And I'm very thankful to Dr. Abby because I can recall, I can recall some years ago, 
there was I saw this this communication about fibroids and research being done on it, and it piqued my interest because I know I had fibroids, but I never had anybody to speak to on the issue. As a matter of fact, I felt a bit ashamed because you know when you don't have knowledge, you tend to feel ashamed to share, or maybe you feel like you are the only one being affected in this way. We, we're not properly educated about these things. And that forum actually allowed me to speak to her, engage her, she asked me how I felt, and different things. And so that actually provided some level of hope for me, you know, being in that situation. So I know sometimes it can really be difficult dealing with the issue, especially dealing with the issue on your own, not having the appropriate resources or the support systems around you, but there's hope. There's hope, it's not a hopeless situation. And in my case, I know sometimes we're always concerned about our fertility and how that affects us. But if you're able to address the situation early, your fertility chances can be intact. I know as women, we tend to think about that and how it can affect our fertility chances as well. And not having anyone to speak to around those critical issues can double our distress level at times. So I really appreciate this forum. I hope that if you have any questions directed to me in the end that I would be able to offer as much as I know and you would benefit. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karita, for being so open and sharing your experience with us. We really appreciate it. So if you have any questions for Karita, you can put them in the chat and then we'll get to them at the end. But now I am going to hand over to Dr. Abigail Falala. She's an obstetrician and gynecologist. And today she's representing the British Caribbean Doctors and Dentists Association. And she's going to take us through a presentation around uh, managing fibroid pain. So over to you, Dr. Falala. Hello, I'm just going to get my heads up. Um, okay. All right, can everybody see my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Wonderful. So my name is Dr. Abigail Flola. I'm a gynecologist obstetrician in Ipswich, London. Well, close to London, it's actually just outside of Western England. And um, I'm just going to be talking about living with fibroids. I'm going to do a quick stop about really, this is, fibroids are such a big topic. And I, if I wanted to sit down and talk about fibroids in their entirety, it will take me days and weeks and months. So I'm just going to do a quick stop. Um, and then if you save up all your questions for the end, we can talk about different things. So um, my journey, I am a doctor and a patient. Like most black women, I have um, menstrual issues. And so I've been, I actually, it's what got me into this specialty in the first place, um, because actually black women So Dr. Falala, you're breaking up. We might have to take off your video just to save your bandwidth. We often don't get the attention. Okay, I'm going to assume that that's going. <clears throat> Is that any better? I think so. I think so. You're sounding clearer. Okay, wonderful. Um, so what are fibroids? So if you imagine the best illustration that I've had for this is if you imagine a tree and the tree is growing and when you see the bark and the trunk of the tree, you see that it's growing in lines. That's the way the muscles of the womb work. What happens is you can get knots in the tree and you look at the overgrown bits in the tree where it looks a little bit knobbly. That's kind of what a fibroid is. It's overgrowth of muscles. They are benign tumours that usually grow within 
be either the cervix, which is the neck of the womb, or the actual body of the womb. Fibroids can grow in different places. So this diagram just illustrates um, where they grow. So I don't know if you can see my pointer, but at the top, this is the top of the womb. So this is called the fundus here. And this is um, one of the most common, and that the fundus, the top of the womb, is one of the most top common places of, the fi of fibroid growth. And that can really grow to sizes of, as obstetrician and gynecologists, we talk about it in sizes of pregnancy sometimes. Sometimes we'll talk about it. We usually use our grapes or how far along pregnant. <clears throat> what we would call about the size of a three month pregnancy um, or four month pregnancy fibroid growing at the top of the womb. And that can, you can, you can see that the lovely triangular shape of the womb can be distorted by fibroids. So you can get fibroids growing on the inside of the, or just off the lining of the womb where the, what we often call the mucosa. You can get fibroids growing within the actual bulk of the body of the womb. <clears throat> Some of those are called submucosal or just around the outside, which is subserosal. Now, the lo location of the fibroid will often determine what symptoms you get. So one of the biggest things that women often complain about is heavy menstrual bleeding. And this can be, I would say, of all the life, most of the time life um, fibroids are not life-threatening, apart from the time where they cause catastrophic bleeding. And that bleeding can really be life-threatening. You can have women who are having quite literally hemorrhages every month. And those women will come in and say to me, doctor, it feels like somebody's turned on a tap and blood is just flooding out of them. You can get fibroids that cause compression of other organs. So because everything inside your tummy is really jam packed together, you do get, you can get fibroids that if you get a really big fibroid, like the one I demonstrated here at the fundus or by, can cause compression of the organs next to the wound. And so the kidneys get in a backup of flow because it can't drain and get rid of the um, urine as well because of the fibroid blocking thing. So you can get that type of problem. It can com cause compression of the bowel. So women can, talk, can have constipation issues and things along those lines. I'm going to talk a little bit about medication dependence and addiction because of the fibroid pain. Like Karita said, wanting to be out of pain is the most natural thing. And women can have such debilitating pain that they cannot stop medications because of the pain. When you get chronic anemia because of blood loss, you can get end up, end up with heart failure. You can end up with organ damage because the organs are not being sufficiently supplied with blood. And that can affect the kidneys, the liver, the, um, and particularly the heart over time. Chronic pain, like we talked about. Fertility issues is a huge problem with black women according to, because of fibroids. Because unfortunately they can distort the cavity of the womb, you can get recurrent miscarriages or just an inability to fall pregnant because of the fibroids. Pregnancy complications, so even if women do manage to get pregnant, you can get preterm birth. So um, because there's no space, the baby and the fibroid are competing with space. Babies can be the wrong way around. So instead of them being head down, they end up being lying on their side, hands first, or, or bum down breech because they are also trying to find a way around the fibroid. The babies can have difficulty growing you can get horrific pain during pregnancy due to the fibroid. The fibroid can also degenerate, which is when the fibroid kind of dies on itself and that causes horrendous pain. That degeneration pain can be quite difficult. And sexual dysfunction, you can get a lot of pain during sex, especially with cervical fibroids, because it can tilt your womb into a funny axis, causing difficulties with the vaginal canal 
now. And so actually painful sex can be a real problem. In the UK, um, it is recognised that we have something called a pain. So Corita took about medicine as um, something that she used. We, we call that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It, parts, it belongs to part of a family. And as part of that, it'll be ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac, things along those lines. Paracetamol. So I would say one of the biggest problems, and Greta mentioned this, was is that all anything we give has side effects. So I would say in terms of side effect profile, the only painkiller that doesn't really have any side effects that will cause problems with long-term use is paracetamol. And that's as long as you use it, the recommended amount, which is one gram every four to six hours, no more than four grams in a day, that doesn't tend to cause problems. However, it is not as effective in managing the pain sometimes as we would like it to be. So we always say start on the lowest um, rung of the ladder. So paracetamol, in conjunction with ibuprofen, you can use them both together. And using them to manage short-term pain is the best option. Using them as a long-term pain management is not a good option. As Karina talked about, you can get a situation where you can get, um, particularly with long-term ibuprofen use, you can get ulceration in the tummy. And that causes problems later on. You can get bleeding in the gut a lot of pain, um, and that can be life-threatening. You can also get a lot of issues in terms of the kidney function in association with ibuprofen long-term use, which is a problem because as black people, we are more likely to have chronic kidney disease anyway. So you might not have a lot of leeway to use ibuprofen long-term. If you're using ibuprofen, the recommended amount, so 400, three times a day, 400 milligrams three times a day for a short course. So for example, for five or six days every month, that's not problematic, but anything more than five or six days a month, you start to end up with long-term issues. And with ibuprofen, you should be taking that with food, with a good meal. So then when we move up to the next rung of the ladder, we start talking about things like codeine, um, low-dose opiates of codeine, morphine, and um, things called neuropathic um, analgesia. Those are things that really block the pain signals coming from the nerves. So sometimes you can have compression of the nerves in your legs. So sometimes women will come in and say, I have this horrendous pain going down my leg. And that could be caused by the fibroid as well. So we use things like amitriptyline, gabapentin, but those often can come along with side effects of dependence. So women become unfortunately quite addicted to it because it's not just pain, it affects every aspect of your life. And studies have shown that actually things like long-term use of codeine, long-term use of morphine, long-term use of um, neuropathic agents is not good for the body. It's not what the body wants and it's not what actually opiates were designed for. They really shouldn't be used for any longer than a short amount of time, so five, six days. Longer than that, it then becomes chronic use, which is associated with issues. And unfortunately, the more you use them, the less they work. So you find you're needing more and more and more to deal with the pain. Again, like I said, if you're using things for a short-term basis, so let's say you're using codeine plus ibuprofen plus paracetamol, together for five or six days of your period and then stopping completely, that is always going to be a better option than chronic long-term usage. High dose opiates or strong opiates, things such as tramadol, um, long-term, long-acting opiates like um, oxycodone, things like that, that's really the end of our ladder. That's where we would say that you're pain is not managed and you're using a really high dose of, of medication just to get on top of the pain. So that's
things that we do that can manage fibroids. Now, actually, you have is being at your late 40s. Or forties and fifties. This is not so much, and um, this has been better in terms of surgical approaches. Is often better in terms of managing that um, fibroids in that situation. Sometimes it might be reasonable to consider using something short term if you're not planning on having children in the next year or two years. Managing it in the short term in order to gain long term gain. Now, what we would use surgically to manage pain would depend on where the fibroid is. So this is by no means a medical advice of what to do with your fibroid. That's something that should be a discussion between yourself and your gynecologist. It is, and it, there are a lot of options and not every option is suitable depending on where the fibroid is. So we talked about conservative pain relief and those would be fertility, but the things would, like we talked about in the previous slide, would be fertility preserving. Those would keep, they would not affect your fertility. You can use them in conjunction with tranexamic acid, which is a tablet that you take to reduce the amount of bleeding. And that can be a really good temporary measure until you get to the point where you don't want to have children anymore. You could do something a little bit more long lasting. There are sometimes things that we do that we would say are not fertility um, reducing, but they are necessary to manage the fibroid issues at the, that point in time. There's something called a TCRF, which is a trans cervical resection of a fibroid. And essentially what you do is you pass a tube through the cervix and shave away the fibroid. It looks a bit like, you know, an ice cream cone um, you know, when you're scooping out ice cream with the ice cream scooper, it's a bit like that. And you scoop and core away the fibroid. That only works if you've got a fibroid inside the cavity that you can get to. And you live in a place where your obstetrician or gynecologist can do that. And that can be done and that can really help with symptoms because it can remove the fibroid that's causing problems. But again, it's very dependent on the location. And also it has risks itself. There are a lot of women with problematic fibroids, especially fundal fibroids that undergo something called a myelectomy. That's where you are put to sleep. There is a cut in the tummy and the surgeon will remove the fibroid one by one, will cut them out each one. Of course, this, like I said, only works if you have got fibroids that are amenable to that. So sometimes the fibroids deep on the inside are not amenable to the myomectomy. And in and itself comes with risks. It comes with risks of bleeding. It comes with risks of requiring blood transfusion. It comes with problems later on if you plan to get pregnant, because after you've had a myomectomy, especially if you um if where the fibroid has been removed from kind of leaves a space in the cavity of the womb, you then can get an issue where when you go into labor, if you fall pregnant later on, the womb can essentially rip open. So therefore we recommend a cesarean section in those situations. You can end up with scar and adhesions, scarring on the inside of the tummy later on, which causes pain when um, you're when you're having your period. So it can make things better and it can make things worse. You can use things called GNRH analogs and what they are is essentially something to help shrink the fibroids. While you're on them, you would you essentially would not be able to have children, but there's something that we can use in the short term to shrink the fibroids. So you give you, yourself a monthly or three monthly injection and they shrink the fibroids significantly. The problem with that is it essentially induces a medical menopause, which has side effects in and, in and of itself. It also can cause um, problems when you stop the medication, they can grow back. And that's a problem if you're a young woman and you're looking to fall pregnant. That's a, that's a bit of an issue. 
if you're later on in life and you're not looking at pregnancy, you can think about a hysterectomy. And a lot of women with fibroids do end up down this line, unfortunately. Sometimes even the hysterectomy is considered extremely dangerous because of the fact that removing the womb is so problematic because the fibroids are so big. And especially if you've had a lot of operations in a tummy, it might be technically difficult, meaning your risk of actually having serious harm in the table goes up astronomically. That can be a problem also if you've got incredibly large fibroids. Some places are just don't have the skill necessary to deal with that. So then actually getting surgery can prove tr tricky and difficult. There are some women who undergo what we call a uterine artery embolization, which is where you cut off the blood supply to the womb, you reduce the blood supply to the womb, and that hopes to shrink the fibroids. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes it does. And sometimes it works a little bit, and sometimes it doesn't work as much as we'd like it to. So that in itself can be quite problematic. And then the same, and that is particularly problematic for fertility. So you won't be able to use that if you plan on having children later on in life. So you really are kind of, each option has its own risks and downsides, but it is dependent on the woman, where she is and what stage in her life, what is her predominant issue? Is it bleeding, is it pain? How, where is the fibroids and where, how can we deal with that? But there are a fair few options to manage fibroids. Um, I'm going to take questions at the end because uh, I can see that someone has raised their hand and I will, I promise I'll take questions at the end. Just keep hold of your questions and I'll answer them. Problem with pain, not all pains are equal. Unfortunately, some pains are really worse than others. Often nerve compression pain is a pain that's really difficult to deal with. Period cramping pain can be really problematic but at least we know that that's going to end at the end of the period but pain that is constant and persistent that does not go away and debilitates your life as Karida mentioned that can stop you from doing the things that you need to keep sane like leaving the house or even running or exercise it can be problematic it also we know that women who are experiencing chronic pain have a higher rate of depression and anxiety and it can really just get you down. I've seen fibroids ruin relationships because of problems with sex and problems with um, managing their day-to-day -day lives that really does have a horrible effect on relationships. There are so many different ways to manage that. But one of the things is that I will say is coming at it from multiple angles. It is a debilitating condition. Having someone you can talk to, whether that is in the structural therapy or not, is a good idea. Um, dealing with fibroid degeneration can be a big problem, but that's a pain that should be temporary. My advice to my patients generally for fibroid degeneration is when the pain comes, use a lot of painkillers and use it for no more than five days. After five days, it should you should try and get off all the painkillers because after five days, the fibroid degeneration should be a lot better. And often what is happening is your fibroid is literally dying off, it's dying, it, it's dying in on itself and it is really, really painful. And if you don't manage the pain in the initial phase of the highest amount of pain, then it can become problematic. Um, it's worth having someone to talk to, like I mentioned. Opiates, which are things like liquid morphine, um, high-dose codeine, um, oxycodone, long-tech, short-tech, things like that. It can become a dependency issue. And using them daily all the time is generally bad. We would consider as medical professionals not good for your health. In terms of non-steroid or anti-inflammatories, using them for longer than five or six days, high dose is problematic because of the risk of ulcers in the tummy and kidney disease and heart disease. So that, that is something that is not, is not a good idea generally. So there has to be a way to manage them. And you have to figure out what works for you, 
I don't know what that is. And it depends on where your fibroids are and what problems they're causing you. But that is what works for you has got to be the way that you navigate it. And that's often done in this care setting with your, if it's your um, general practitioner managing it, your family doctor, or if it's going to be a gynecologist. I generally recommend gynecologists manage these um, problems of fibroids. So, um, Rita mentioned this earlier, but food and lifestyle. We know that um, a diet high in dairy foods is generally not good. As black people, generally, we don't tend to do very well with high amounts of dairy. So reducing that intake can work really well for people. Processed carbohydrates is, a, is generally quite bad. High fructose corn syrup is generally quite bad. These foods do feed fibroids because they increase your estrogen production um, by making you put on the wrong weight. A diet high in iron is going to be the right thing for all women with fibroids. So green leafy vegetables, meat can work, but also lean meats is better than meats high in fat like pork. So generally, if you're going to do meats, then um, beef does work. But there are a lot of um, supplements that you can take. Vitamin D, all black people should be on vitamin D, especially if you don't live in in a hot sunny climate like the Caribbean or the Africa. If you're living in places like Europe, then it's definitely a good idea. High vitamin D supplementation around your period is generally shown to reduce the amount of bleeding and pain associated with um, fibroids and um, period problems. Foods with a low glycemic index, so they're generally high in fibres. So um, that's things like if you're going to eat rice, brown rice, reducing the amount of carbohydrates in general is a good idea. Um, and um, brown, not very processed carbohydrates, so white flours, anything made from white flours. If you're going to eat um, carbohydrates, then try for the brown stuff, so brown bread and things like that. Exercise does help significantly. It helps to reduce the weight, which does help reduce with fibroids because if you have excess weight, then unfortunately you will be having excess estrogen. Excess estrogen will make the fibroids grow. So reducing and keeping the weight down is a good idea. And fibroids do help with chronic pain. Studies have shown that it really does. It releases endorphins that... Um, um, exercise releases endorphins that will reduce pain with um, fibroids over time. So it's a good idea. Anything with excessive estrogens. Um, so actually high amounts of soy products contain a lot of estrogen to so reduce that um, significantly. Um, and then, like I said, man maintaining a low body fat percentage. BMI can be quite tricky in terms of black women because it can be a bit off because we tend to have more muscle mass than um, white women. However, we all know that that is not a huge amount, and we all know when we're a little bit too heavy. So reducing our body fat percentage is always a good idea. Um, so I'm going to take questions, and then we can. Or do you think, Abby, that it's better to do a Q and A and do questions as part of that? Yeah, so we can do a Q&A um, and, and take questions as part of the Q&A at the end. Okay. So that's really it. Um, my big thing to say is that one solution does not fit all. One solution is there's never going to be one thing that fixes it. And often it's about using more than one thing at a go. So it's about doing all of the things, diet, exercise, painkillers when you need them, and then and stop it when you need them, working through the psychology of having fibroids and the anxiety and sadness that it does cause being in pain all the time, um, coming at it from that angle at the same time, all these things work together to reduce, to improve your quality of life. And it's about making it long work long-term. It's not about the short-term, it's about making it long-term. And then actually, if we get into the stage of your life where you're not thinking about having children, and surgery is always an option and it is something to really strongly consider. All right.